Well, welcome to our uh, live stream of the Black Diamond Gospel Chapel. Uh, we definitely live some unique times. And uh, one thing that I'm hearing and feeling is that there's a lot of folks uh, who are kind of clamoring uh, for uh, people to be together, especially the saints, which is a good thing. I want to read uh, just a quick text and then we will uh, hear from Pastor Matt. It says, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encourage one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. It is good to meet with the saints. We're going to be discussing this text uh, a little bit more. We're going to try to live stream uh, on Wednesday evening uh, and discuss this text and what does it mean to fellowship. And so uh, if you want to join us for that live stream uh, on Wednesday night, be prepared uh, for that. Uh, but before we hear the text of God preached, let's bow in a word of prayer as we begin and as we hear the sermon this morning. Father, this is truly unique. But we are so thankful for technology. We are thankful that even though we can't meet face to face, we can still gather and use technology to encourage one another. So, Father, grab hold of our hearts with, our, with your text this morning as we continue to examine the truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In your name I pray. Amen. So if you have your Bibles, join me, 1 Corinthians 15, and Pastor Matt will come on up and declare the word of God to us this morning. Good morning, church. I trust that you'll be able to hear me okay this morning. Uh, we don't have uh, the best microphone, so hopefully this uh, is okay for you. Uh, as Pastor Bryce said, this is not ideal. This is not ideal, but what a privilege it is that by God's common grace, he has given us technology to use to be able to do these kinds of things in these very unique seasons. But I want you to hear this, and Pastor Bryce has already alluded to it. This is not a replacement for the corporate gathering. As soon as we are able to do so, we are going to be back in person. And we want you to know that I'm going to discuss that a little bit more on my Facebook page. I try to do a post every other day. Tomorrow, I'm going to discuss that on my Facebook page so you can look for that. We hope to, in the coming weeks, develop a YouTube uh, playlist of songs that you can go and, uh, and hear some songs, sing along with some good, godly uh, Christian songs to stir your heart, uh, as the saints are called to sing. You're looking, uh, or pardon me, yeah, be looking for that. We're going to carry on in our series in 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15 is the longest treatment on the resurrection in the whole Bible. And in a time like this, what we need is the resurrection hope. Because the reality, today I'm asking you to hang with me. By the end of the message, I trust that you will see hope. But as we walk through Paul's initial argument for the resurrection, he actually starts by looking at the negative. As, as to help them understand the importance of truly holding to and believing upon the resurrected Christ. So hang with me. There is hope to be found here in our times like this. Let me, uh, let me start with an illustration that, was, uh, that I heard a little while back about a man who lived in Maine for a few summers and told his friends about a particular town called Flagstaff. This town was to be flooded as part of a, uh, a dam that was going to be built and they were going to have to flood. This happening is that people stopped fixing up their homes. They stopped repairing things in the town. Eventually, the town basically just went to seed. It became a woebegone community. And he would go on to say this, where there is no faith in the future, there is no power in the present. And really, that's what... Paul is going to say to the believers here in Corinth that they, if, if you don't have a faith in the future because of the resurrection, it's going to affect how you live now. But let's look at that text, 1 Corinthians 15, 12 to 19. Here's what the Word of God says. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, 
whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. This is quite an argument. I would say to you that the, the main theme of all of 1 Corinthians 15 as he walks them through the resurrection is that the resurrection of Christ is the basis of our hope. But here in this text, he comes at it from the negative, and he basically is saying that without the resurrection of Christ, we have no hope. And so he's telling them they need to be careful about their understanding or their thinking, their flawed thinking, that there is no resurrection. Because if there's no resurrection, there are some serious ramifications. He's just explained in the first 11 verses of this chapter, in some detail, the various proofs of the resurrection. There is no doubt that Christ had been raised. Peter saw him alive. James saw him alive. The 12 saw him alive. The apostles saw him alive. 500 people gathered at one time saw Jesus alive. There was overwhelming proof most of those people were still alive at the time of the writing of this letter. They could go and verify for themselves that Jesus had risen. But here, he is concerned that they were not believing this. They had received a letter, or pardon me, Paul had received a letter from them. 1 Corinthians 7 verse 1 says that they wrote Paul, and he was responding to, obviously, what they wrote him. And clearly, part of what they wrote him was to say that there's probably a large chunk in the church that had ceased believing in the resurrection. And I'd say ceased believing because Paul says in uh, 1 Corinthians 6 verse 11, after saying that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God, he says in 6 verse 11, such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the spirit of our God. The fact that he says that they were justified implies that at one point they did hold to the resurrection. And that along the way, somehow, and we don't know how, we're not told how, but along the way, a good swath of the Christian church there were struggling with and seemingly had ceased to hold to the resurrection. And his warning is this, if we do not hold to the resurrection, there are deadly consequences. Now we are dealing with a deadly time in history right now. You will be able to say, you young kids, you teenagers, <laughs> you'll be able to say, I was there during the COVID-19 pandemic. Here are the latest COVID-19 stats as of yesterday. Uh, I, I don't know what the stats are of this morning, but as of last night, here are the statistics. In Canada, there were 1,388 cases of COVID-19. 19 Canadians have died of this disease. Globally, as of last night, there were over 307,000 global cases of COVID-19. And globally, there were over 13,000 people that have died of COVID-19. But what Paul is saying is this that the deadly consequences of not holding to the resurrection far outweigh anything that's deadly in this world. COVID-19 can take my physical life, the first death. But if I don't hold to the resurrection, that now deals with the second death, eternal death. That's a far greater consequence than anything in this world. That's far deadlier. And Paul is saying, listen guys, you need to understand that there are some deadly consequences to not holding to the resurrection. Now, we should understand that Corinth was part of the Greek culture. And because of that, because they were part of the Greek culture, they had some particularly unique views that affected why they would view the resurrection this way. John MacArthur explains it well. He says this, A basic tenet of much ancient Greek philosophy was dualism a concept generally attributed to Plato. Dualism considered everything spiritual to be intrinsically good, 
and everything physical to be intrinsically evil. To anyone holding that view, the idea of a resurrected body was repugnant. For them, the very reason for going to an afterlife was to escape all things physical. So to hold to a physically resurrected body was repugnant to much of Greek culture. Not only that, any Jews that were present, if there were any Sadducees there, the Sadducees as well did not hold to a resurrection. So it's no wonder why we have a, a great large group that are struggling with the teaching of the resurrection. And Paul says this, though. If there is no resurrection, that includes Christ. Look at what he says in verse 13. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And what are the consequences? What are the ramifications if Christ has been hasn't been raised? What if? Really, that's what Paul's saying. What if there is no resurrection? What are the consequences? And he lists them here. Let's look at them one by one. First thing he says is this. If Christ hasn't been raised, then our preaching is in vain. Gospel preaching is absolutely vanity if Christ hasn't been raised. It's you should not be preaching because if Christ hasn't been raised, sin hasn't been conquered. Death hasn't been conquered. Hell hasn't been conquered. That means the only thing we've been walking around talking about is bad news. We would have no good news. What's the point in preaching if we only have bad news? All preaching should stop immediately. If there is no resurrection. He takes it a step further though. Not only is gospel preaching in vain. If there's no resurrection. He, would say, he goes on to say this. And your faith is in vain. In verse 14. Your faith is in vain. Not only should preaching stop. Your faith should stop. What, what do you have faith in. If there's no resurrection. To have a vain faith. Means to have an empty faith. If the one that we call our Savior is dead, what hope do we have? We have no hope. Think about those poor folks that we have listed for us in the book of Hebrews in chapter 11, commonly referred to as the Hall of Faith. Listen to this, Hebrews 11, starting in verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth for people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland if they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out they would have had opportunity to return but as it is they desire a better country that is a heavenly one therefore god is not ashamed to be called their god for he has prepared for them a better city you see what i what i'm reading there if there is no resurrection then they absolutely should have gone back to where they came from their faith was in vain, but as such, they lived their lives giving up sacrificially all that they had to follow the Lord. If there's no resurrection, that hope is futile. There's no victory over sin or death or hell. Think about what Paul wrote to the Roman believers in Romans chapter 6, 5 to 11. Paul said this, if we had been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have, been, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. That's a great text. That is super encouraging. What hope there is in that. But if there's no resurrection... That hope immediately evaporates. Paul is warning them about how they think about the resurrection because there are consequences if we don't believe in the resurrection. He goes on to say this, not only is preaching in vain, not only is our faith in vain, but then we're found to be misrepresenting God, it says in verse 15. The Corinthians, the believers that were there, believed in the creator God. 
But they were just struggling with the resurrection itself. And he says, listen, if you believe there's no resurrection, then, then the preachers have been misrepresenting God, or they have been false witnesses, as many translations say. The actual word here is pseudo-martyr, a false witness. You've been saying something about God that if, it's, if the resurrection isn't true, you're saying something that's a lie about God. You're being a false witness. We don't want to stand around people who give us a false testimony about something that isn't true. A story was told about a, a store manager, and he heard his clerk talking to a customer, and he heard his clerk say this to the customer, no ma'am, we haven't had any for a while, and it doesn't look as if we'll be getting any soon. The horrified manager came running over and he said, no, no, of course we'll have some soon. We just placed an order for that last week. The lady walked away very confused. The manager took his clerk aside and he said, never, never, never say that we're out of anything. You always say we've ordered it and it's coming. Now, what was it that you wanted? Rain, said the clerk. That's a false witness. That is trying to give truth that isn't his to give. And the same is true in a far greater scale. If Christ hasn't been raised from the dead, all of these people that have been teaching about the Christ have been lying. In Acts chapter 2, the very first sermon to the church, listen to what Peter says here in verses 23 and 24. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. That's a great glorious truth. But if the resurrection isn't true, that was a lie. Peter would have been misrepresenting God. And Paul, as he continues this argument for the resurrection from the negative side, now gets to the serious brass tacks of the matter. He says this in verse 16. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. We've looked at that. Your faith is vain. And you are still in your sins. Here's the rub. Here's the reality. If Christ hasn't been raised, we are all still in our sins. If the Savior is still in the grave, sin has clearly won. And in us who have put our faith in Jesus, who put our faith in the resurrected Christ, sin is still winning in us. That's the reality if the resurrection isn't true. All those glorious truths that we read about in Scripture regarding our freedom from sin and the bondage that we are under in sin being obliterated by Christ, all of that will be blown to the wind like chaff. John 14, 19, Jesus said, because he lives, we too would live. But that would be a lie if the resurrection wasn't true. In Romans chapter 4, Paul said this in verses 24 and 25. It will be kept. If he wasn't raised, that means we're not justified and we're still in our sins. And what Paul then does is he takes the argument then even a step further. And he says this. So, if you're still in your sins, and then he says in verse 18, then, he transitions, this is a connecting verse, then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. That is to say, the dead in Christ are in hell if there's no resurrection. That's the logical assumption. Because if you're still in your sins, and then you die, where are you going? The ones who are still in their sins at their death are going to hell. That's what the Word of God says. If we are, if the loved ones that we know that have passed away, who were in Christ, they believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ, if the resurrection wasn't actually true, then all those who placed their hope in Christ were duped, and today they are suffering eternal damnation. That's what Paul's getting at. He is helping them see the gravity of their faulty thinking. 
Here's the gravity futile. He says to the Thessalonians in chapter 4, verse 14 of the first letter, For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Well, if there's no resurrection, that wouldn't be true. And then Paul finally gets to the brass tacks at the very end. If in Christ we have, we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be paid. If our hope in Christ is only hope in the here and now, and there isn't anything beyond this, and let's be honest, if there's no resurrection, there's no hope beyond this world. So if the res resurrection is not true, we are to be pitied more than all. Maybe John Lennon was right when he sang Imagine. We should all be living for today instead of living for someone else for another day. Think about uh, the, the testimony that Paul gave just earlier in this very letter. In 1 Corinthians 4, he said this about himself and the apostles in verses 9 and 10. For I, I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all, like men sentenced to death, because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are held in honor, but we in disrepute. Well, those poor apostles, if the resurrection isn't true, why were they living like that? Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3 that those who desire to live godly lives in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Well, why would you live like that if there's no resurrection? Why would you live like that if there's no resurrection? What a pitiful way to live if the resurrection isn't true. And there were those who did not believe the resurrection to be true. What I am so thankful for is that chapter 15 doesn't end at verse 19. Look at the first words of verse 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. In fact, he is now going back to those first 11 verses. He's drawing upon all the proofs overwhelming proofs of the resurrection. Paul himself saw the resurrected Lord alive. Peter him alive. James saw him alive. 500 witnesses saw him alive. The apostles saw him alive. He rose from the dead. The tomb is empty. So we don't live with no hope. We do live with all hope. The resurrection is a truth that we can cling to. For all of those who don't hold to the resurrection, and there may be some watching this that do not hold to the resurrection, we want to pray for you. If you know of some that don't hold to the resurrection, pray for them. Because if you don't hold to the resurrection, then when your loved one dies and that enormous grief that overwhelms you takes in and takes over, it's understandable. If there's no resurrection, it's understandable that you would be grieved with no hope. If there's no resurrection, or if you don't believe in the resurrection, the, the hedonistic chasing after pleasure in the here and now makes perfect sense. You think about all those people that flock down foolishly for spring break to the Florida beaches. Folly. But if there's no resurrection and this life is all we got, maybe that makes sense. The panic that is gripping our world at present because of this pandemic and this virus, if there's no resurrection and this world is it, then that panic suddenly becomes warranted and justified. Of our hope, the resurrection is everything because Christ was raised, sin was defeated, death was defeated, Hell was defeated. Satan was defeated. And all those who are in Christ are victorious in him. He has won the war and we live with hope. The resurrection is the basis for our hope and we should live with hope. Those of you who are believers, you should be jumping up and down and saying, yes and amen. Jesus has risen Yes, these circumstances are dire and difficult right now, 
But my hope isn't in this world. My hope isn't in my circumstances. It is in my Savior. And it's in the world to come. Yesterday was International Down Syndrome Day. And so it's fitting that I would share with you an illustration about a boy named Philip who had Down Syndrome. This story was in Leadership Magazine a number of years ago. Philip attended a third grade Sunday school class with several other eight-year-old boys and girls. And typical of children that age, they did not readily accept Philip into their circle, into their sphere. Because of a, a very good Sunday school teacher, a very creative Sunday school teacher, they began to accept Philip, but they always held him at arm's length. Well, the week after Easter Sunday, uh, the teacher brought a number of those pantyhose containers that looked like eggs. She brought a number of empty eggs along with her to the class. And she told the class, let's go outside. It's a beautiful day. Go in the yard and stuff this egg full of symbols. And they brought them back. And so finally, one by one, the teacher would open up an egg and they would all ooh and ah the various things that were in there. But finally, they came to one egg. And that egg, when she opened it, was empty. And one kid said, that's dumb. Someone didn't do their assignment. And Philip spoke up. Apparently, without missing a beat, said, I did so do it. I did so do it. It's empty. The tomb is empty. Silence followed. From that point on, Philip became a fully engaged member of that group, fully accepted by that Sunday school class. Sadly, shortly after that Sunday, he contracted an infection that most typical children would have been able to fight off, but he didn't, and he died. And at his funeral, that Sunday school class of eight-year-olds walked up to the casket, and each one placed an empty egg on his casket, symbolizing the hope that Philip lived with. If you are in Christ, you too should live with the same hope as that young boy, Philip. When your loved one dies who is in Christ, yes, you're going to grieve. There is a time to grieve and to mourn, absolutely. But you should grieve and mourn with hope. When my wife's mother passed away a couple of years ago, we grieved. The family grieved. But we know that because of her faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, she is home today with the Lord. So there was grief with hope. When my father passed away in October, yes, we grieved. Yes, it hurt, but we grieved with hope knowing he is home with his Savior because of the resurrection. When tempted with all the carnal pleasures of this world, like spring break and all those things that we see advertised, we, the believer, we who hold to the resurrection, we resist in the strength that God provides, knowing that we live for his glory, not only now, but for all eternity, we will live in his glory. When a virus is spreading all over the world, we walk wisely, as we should, but we do not walk in fear, because God is greater, and he has promised a world where there will be no sin, and no effects of sin because of the resurrected Christ and the finished work that he has accomplished, defeating sin, defeating hell, defeating death. And so we, the believer, should never doubt the resurrection, but rather should have our confidence in the resurrection. Because of the resurrection, we have hope for today and bright hope for tomorrow. And so let me conclude with John's words. John said this in his first epistle, 1 John 5, verses 4 and 5, he said this, Everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Jesus is the Son of God, the risen Son of God. So live with hope. Yes, these are weird times. Yes, these are shaky times in, in many respects. And yet for the believer, our hope hasn't changed. 
Our hope for Christ is the same today as it was yesterday and the same as it will be tomorrow. Why? Because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We serve a risen Savior. Let me pray. Father, we are grateful and thankful and we rejoice today that we have hope in Christ, a hope that does not waver. Father, for those who perhaps are struggling with their understanding of the resurrection, Father, would you make them aware that there is evidence upon evidence of the resurrection? And also, Lord, by your spirit, would you just awaken their hearts to see the reality of their sin and risen Savior, that he has conquered sin and death. And because of that, our hope is sure. Our hope is lasting. And so, Father, encourage us with this. May we live as people who have hope, because we know, in fact, Christ has been risen from the dead. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.